Poland is not yet dead. March, march Dombrowski at our legion's head to Poland. And all clapped and cried in chorus, March, march Dombrowski to our land before us. My general, this land of ours has waited long for you, just as the Jews for their Messiah do. Of you the singers long did prophesy, of you the portents spoke that fill the sky. Dombrowski's Polish legions were part of Napoleon's army. As Napoleon marched towards Moscow in 1812, the nobles of old Poland celebrated liberation. A false dawn. It was followed by a hundred years of foreign oppression. Then another warrior rose. Józef Piłsudski. He led Poland to independence. I saw him for the first time as he was coming along a small corridor, a sort of waiting room, cleaning his teeth with a toothpick. And I can honestly say that I fell in love with him straight away. Why? His gravity. In his face there was no coquetry, no desire to be liked deep in thought. He charmed me. It's odd, but it was the toothpick. His vision was the same as mine. That is, to be Polish, one does not need to be a Pole by blood and bones through grandfather and great-grandfather, but anyone who considers himself a Pole and therefore Jews, Belarusians, Lithuanians, who shared his idea of Poland, were for us Poles, or almost Poles, brothers at any rate. In the name of Almighty God, we, the people of Poland, thanking Providence for freeing us from a century and a half of enslavement, remembering the bravery, endurance, and selfless struggles of past generations who devoted their best energies to the cause of independence, striving for the welfare of the whole united and independent mother country, and desiring to ensure the equality of all its citizens, adopt and affirm this Constitution. The Polish state is a republic. The republic guarantees the protection of life, freedom and property, irrespective of origin, nationality, language, race or religion. The republic recognizes no hereditary or class privileges. Every citizen has the right to state protection in his work, and in cases of unemployment, illness or misfortune, the right to social security. The constitution of the new Polish state was adopted in March 1922. It invested Parliament with sweeping powers and deprived the President of effective authority. Pesutsky, head of state since independence, was leader of the broad left. He had the support of Poland's national minorities. Presidential elections came, but Pesutsky declined to stand. Gabriel Narutowicz replaced him as candidate of the centre-left. Overcoming the tough and bitter challenge from the right, Narutowicz was elected. Five days later, the president was murdered. A friend of mine saw what happened and ran immediately to the general staff. And without asking the adjutant, he rushed into Pilsudski's office shouting, Commander, they've killed Narutowicz. Well, he saw the marshal's face, which turned to stone. Pilsudski told them all to leave the room and remained alone. The election had been decided by the vote of the national minorities. 
the right claimed that Jews and Ukrainians had imposed their president on Poland. The assassin was a lone nationalist fanatic. Piłsudski used his influence to prevent the spread of violence, but the wounds ran deep. The murder of Narutowicz was a certain borderline in Pilsudski's life. When something finished, and when a completely different Pilsudski began, Pilsudski stopped talking to people. He only chose those with whom he wanted to talk. It was a different Pilsudski. It was a great shock to him. This terrible murder revealed to him a different side of Poland. Piłsudski had developed a distaste for party politics and withdrew from political life. A large part of the army still hoped he would return to command it, and the left, too, still saw him as its natural leader. The leading figure of the Polish right and Piłsudski's principal adversary was Roman Domowski. Domowski's nationalist philosophy was anti-German and anti-Semitic. It held that ethnic Poles alone could forge a strong nation. Domowski was basking in the glory of the Treaty of Versailles, which he had recently signed as a Polish delegate. He had won great recognition one could even say there was a cult of Roman Dmowski. In his country retreat, Dmowski assembled his disciples. He railed against the weaknesses of Polish parliamentary government. You young people must remember that in order to give Poland a strong government, the March Constitution must be changed. Poland was reborn bankrupt, a patchwork state torn out of three dying empires. Ten million citizens were not ethnically Polish. A succession of weak governments grappled with three different economic and legal systems. The majority of the population were peasants, struggling to eke out a living from the land. Domowski's supporters denied the reality of a multinational state. They saw the true Poland in an idealized image of the Catholic Church. The mood of the Polish right was heightened after Mussolini came to power in Italy. They were fascinated by the fascist example, surrendered to the attractions of the system. Public opinion felt that the tendency to imitate at least partially, Mussolini's system and its methods was growing stronger among Polish right-wing organizations. Roman Domowski traveled to Rome and then to Paris on a confidential mission. It was May 1926. He told me it is time to end the power of the parliament. The time has come. We must make a revolution. I have come abroad to test opinion and prepare the Western powers for such an eventuality. The right believed that Pilsudski was a spent force and that power was theirs for the taking. But when the government appeared to be drifting into nationalist hands, Pilsudski was moved to act. He asked President Wojciechowski, an old political friend, to dismiss the government. 
Troops loyal to Pazutsky took up positions near the Poniatowski Bridge in Warsaw. The president summoned Marshal Pazutsky to a meeting. The marshal's liaison officer that day was Lieutenant Jabrowski. Ukłonili się sobie pan prezydent uchylił kapelusza i they bowed to each other. The president tipped his hat and said haughtily, Marshal, I request that you immediately return your troops to the barracks. A stalemate ensued. Presidential regiments barred Pazutsky's way. Unwilling to start a civil war, the marshal withdrew. Then soldiers manning a second Warsaw Bridge went over to his side and shooting broke out. Street battles raged for three days. 379 people were killed, many of them civilians. The battle turned when railway workers went on strike supporting Pilsudski and denied transport to the government. President Wojciechowski resigned. Pilsudski's reluctant coup ended in his total victory. The Accord de Paris was so folded that I could read a military coup. At once I ran to the telephone and called Domowski. I could understand how disconcerted he was, that it had upset all his own plans. But he said, and I remember the words well, it is good that the boil has finally burst. <laughs> The challenge of the right had been crushed. The left rejoiced, expecting that power would now be shared with them. Even the communists backed Pilsudski. To legitimize the coup, Pilsudski allowed himself to be elected president, then declined the office. The posts of president and prime minister were handed to his supporters, Moyshitsky and Bartel. Parliament was largely ignored. The marshal himself disdained the trappings of power and let the ritual of parliamentary democracy continue. But in stature, he towered above his associates. His personal authority made the wheels of government turn. When Pilsudski seized power, Europe was at peace. But Poland's two great neighbors, the Soviet Union and Germany, were not reconciled to the new Polish state. The Soviet Union still coveted the eastern half of Poland, and Germany hoped to reclaim its former Polish provinces. Germany was becoming a European power once more. Europe's other great powers, Britain and France, were losing interest in Poland. After the Locarno Treaty of 1925, the post-war frontiers between Germany and France were guaranteed. The German-Polish border was not. The worldwide trade boom in the late 20s was helping the Polish economy to grow. Exploiting the miners' strike in Britain, Polish coal won new export markets. Pilsudski's regime had stabilized the currency. It had established an efficient bureaucracy. But major land reform had been shelved, and industry craved fresh investment. In 1930, the Great Depression crossed the ocean and in Poland, its effect on the working classes was catastrophic. Soup kitchens sustained the growing mass of unemployed. A sense of betrayal spread through the rank and file. In the summer of 1930, the peasant and socialist parties came together to mount a powerful democratic challenge to Pilsudski's regime. Thousands of people came to Krakow, although the police tried to stop peasants from reaching the city. In the end, they got to Krakow, and the scale of that demonstration, which walked through the town with the slogan, we demand the president's resignation, really made a deep impression. 
The Krakow protest was to be the first step in a great campaign to rouse the people and give back power to Parliament. Piłsudski's answer was to dismiss Parliament and call an election for November 1930. He had prominent opposition MPs arrested and mounted an election campaign while his opponents languished in a military fortress. No visits were allowed. We couldn't send parcels. The prisoners were starved. The prisoners were beaten. They were humiliated. In southeastern Poland, Ukrainian nationalists were undermining Pilsudski's election chances. Underground groups employed terrorism to foster the concept of an independent Ukrainian state. Pilsudski sent in the army. They destroyed all Ukrainian institutions, reading rooms, cooperatives, dairies. All this smashed. Even the signs in the Ukrainian language were destroyed. In the reading rooms, the books were overturned, stamped on, portraits destroyed, torn, broken. They destroyed crops stacked in the fields, left them in the rain so that they would get wet. And then the women from the village were ordered to kill chickens and prepare dinner for these soldiers. Pilsudski won the election. From now on, he devoted himself to the army and to foreign affairs. Post-war Germany had been hostile to the independent Polish state, portraying it as a wedge driven into the living body of Germany and severing its East Prussian limb. The free city of Danzig, with its mainly German population, was a particularly sensitive issue. Established by the Allies in 1919, its government was watched over by the League of Nations. In January 1933, Hitler became Chancellor of Germany. Pilsudski feared that the rise of Nazism would shift the military balance against Poland. He sent a brusque note to Hitler, querying German intentions towards Danzig. Rumour also reached Berlin that Poland was considering the possibility of a preventive war against Germany. Pilsudski was preparing to back up diplomacy with force. Piłsudski was quite willing to make an agreement or a treaty of non-aggression with Germany, but he, he was worried about the nature of the National Socialism and of the dictatorship. While the Nazis paraded for the German electorate in March 1933, Pilsudski defied the League of Nations by sending extra troops to the Polish supply base inside Danzig Harbor. France and Britain expressed outrage. Hitler, however, offered negotiations. On the 26th of January, 1934, Germany signed a non-aggression pact with Poland. The policy towards Poland was formulated from the very beginning by Hitler and was at every stage conducted by Hitler. Hitler dispatched his envoy, Hermann Goering, on a hunting expedition to Poland. Goering's mission was to tempt the Poles with the prospect of sharing the spoils of a future war with Russia. The aging Pilsudski had groomed Colonel Josef Beck as his foreign minister. Within weeks of the Polish-German accord, Colonel Beck went to Moscow to allay Soviet fears. Beck assured his Soviet hosts that Poland would never allow itself to be used as a base for a German attack on the Soviet Union. 
Poland and the Soviet Union had already signed an agreement to respect each other's territorial integrity. Their pact was solemnly extended for 10 years. Piłsudski declared that we now have quite an exceptional situation. We have non-aggression agreements with both our neighbors. Poland has never yet been in such a position. But this unique situation cannot last forever. We must remember that we are seated on two stools. We have to fall off one. The thing is to find out which one we'd fall off first, with whom the war will break out. And then he said that in his judgment, the present situation can last for five years. After five years, it will change completely and new circumstances will arise. Well, the year was 1934. Piłsudski would not suffer any challenge to his leadership. In 1934, as a new generation of nationalists set up a Polish fascist movement, Piłsudski approved the opening of an internment camp in Bereza Kartuska, where fascists, Ukrainian nationalists, and communists were imprisoned without trial. When we arrived, they told us very simply the aim of Bereza. All of you here, Ukrainians and Poles, do not respect the state. A symbol of the state is the policeman. We will teach you to respect the state by arousing your respect for the police. Because you have not acquired this respect in the normal way, we will instill it into you by force. Pilsudski remained the only source of real authority. Though he was now rarely seen in public, everything was done in his name. In failing health, the marshal became an eccentric recluse. He saw few people, talked loudly to himself, became foul-mouthed and abusive. Stories circulated about his interest in spiritualism and the supernatural, about Russian ghosts roaming the Belvedere Palace and disturbing his sleep. His recurrent nightmare was the fate of Poland after his death. One night, an aide heard the marshal's voice and ran into the bedroom. How are you feeling, Commander? And he looked at him and said, do you know what will happen when I am not here? Who can stand against that which awaits Poland? Who will find the force which I still possess? and he spread his arms in despair. Józef Piłsudski died of cancer on the night of May the 12th, 1935. He was a man of instinct, a man of action, a man of broad political vision, 
and in war the only modern commander to lead Poland to victory. Like the Poland he led, Pilsudski was independent and isolated. In power, he became authoritarian and pessimistic. At his death, Poland was still free from foreign domination. Piłsudski's body was carried to Krakow to be buried with the kings of old Poland in the vaults of Wawel Castle. His heart was taken east to his beloved Vilno. This is the new Peugeot 309 GTI. It's capable of 0 to 60 in only 7.8 seconds. You're about to find out just how that feels. GTI, action, not words. Before you check out a Moda, check out Exchange and Mark. With so many cars, prices, and information, you can really wise up. Exchange and more. It gives you more clout. There's a rather special club that offers more than most would expect. The drinks are on the house. The food is delicious. We even have our own private air terminal for your use. There's room to work at this club. Just relax. You can even sleep here for no extra charge. Or just sit back and enjoy the magnificent view. This club is called Pan Am First and Clipper Class. Today, you can expect more from Pan Am. Cleopatra. Queen of Egypt. Cleopatra. Woman of legend, holder of all secrets. Her name is linked with the secret of beauty. Cream and perfume. Cleopatra, a new soap, rich as a cream, sensual as a perfume. Cleopatra, a new soap that might well change the face of the world. Cleopatra, a secret of beauty. This red house gives you a mortgage from Torquay to Timbuktu. This red house ensures your contents from concrete to bamboo. So don't freeze off your assets or let your cash for moose. The net pro gives you sky high interest, makes your money reproduce. For mortgages, insurance, or money in your trousers, join the national and provincial, and you're safe as little red houses. In 1936, after a year of jostling for power, Pilsudski's heirs arranged a controversial ceremony to bestow the mantle of the great man on a political nonentity. Rich Migui had been the late marshal's choice as commander-in-chief. Pilsudski had hoped that this modest soldier would keep the army out of politics. But now the new marshal allowed himself to be cast in the role of a political leader. 
Edward Rich Migwi, an able soldier, was of peasant origin, the first Polish commander-in-chief from such a humble background. At a rally in southern Poland, Rich Migwi faced the principal victims of the economic depression. The countryside was grossly overpopulated and could not support the unemployed millions. Whilst the Catholic Church was still at the root of village life, a growing number of peasants were becoming politicized. Polish peasants were trapped in an existence which had changed little over the centuries. There were not many of us, only 13, and our parents. There was no question of any shoes. We went to school barefoot when it was like today. And when winter came, anyone who had to go outside, and there were six of us at home, had to use the same pair of shoes. My father was forced to send me out. After all, there were younger children at home, and I could fend for myself. I can't remember if I was seven years old or not. But I couldn't have been eight, because at eight, you went to school. I hadn't started school, but I worked as a herdsman. In the summer of 1937, the Peasant Party, now the leading radical force in Polish politics, staged a confrontation with the government a strike to stop the delivery of fresh food to the city markets. In southern Poland, the strike drew strong support. Violence followed. Sixty people were killed. During the strike, the government used police and the army to pacificate the villages active in strike. They were about 6,000 of arrests. The people were beating, were beaten, and ran away into forest, hiding the, themselves in forest. The repressions were terrible. Peasant militancy went back to the days of Tadeusz Kosciuszko, a Polish hero of the American War of Independence. He returned to Poland and in 1794 led a rebel army against the Russians. In the Battle of Ratswawice, a charge of peasant infantry overwhelmed the enemy. Later, the Russians fought back and the Polish kingdom ceased to exist. Kostiuszko was born here, in the Pripyat marshes, part of a vast plain where Europe tails off eastwards. The native people of these regions had not managed to set up states of their own. Throughout history, they had been dominated culturally and politically by the Russians or by the Poles. The question of who governed these boundless lands, who claimed the loyalty of these people, goes to the heart of the perennial dispute between Poland and Russia. If you ask the question, uh, who, uh, who you are, the answer was Catholic, or orthodox. That's the only criterion. More important than any, any other. Uh, people didn't understand what it, what it means, nationality. 
In these territories, Poles, Ukrainians, Jews, Lithuanians, Tatars, Armenians, and Germans offered different prayers and coexisted in poverty. Here, though time appeared to stand still, history was alive. Polish culture drew much of its strength from these lands. It was the home of saints, dreamers, and heroes. Great leaders, Kostiuszko, Pilsudski, great writers, Mickiewicz and Miłosz, grew up here. For the early Polish cinema, this was the land of make-believe. <laughs> In this heartland of Polish romanticism, Poles were in the minority. Landed estates were the centers of Polish culture and influence. There's a part of the Polish-Russian border that's even more mysterious than the forbidden country of Tibet. A barbed fence divides one country from the other, and up till now, it had never been photographed. But our cameraman was fired, um, uh, fired with ambition, and these pictures are the result. Russia uh, has always been felt uh, as an external darkness. Uh, that external darkness used to devour people, deporting them to Siberia and so on. There is a, a completely different uh, relationship between the Poles and the Russians and, for instance, between the Poles and the Germans. Uh, there is a linguistic affinity. Uh, Russian, the Russian language somehow goes uh, to the core of uh, some proto-Slavic uh, roots. Uh, and uh, there is a, a lot of ambiguity uh, in the attitude of, towards Russians. There is a scorn, an attitude of scorn towards the barbarians, a feeling of superiority, uh, and at the same time a feeling of inferiority somehow because of uh, there is a saying, Russian saying, uh, which can be translated as uh, trembling of the smaller <coughs> who faces the bigger guy. Marshal Rich Schmigwe's political ambitions grew swiftly. By 1937, he felt that he needed a political organization of his own. On his orders, a camp of national unity was set up, known as Ozon. With its strident nationalism and hints of anti-Semitism, the Ozon Manifesto seemed to owe more to Domovsky's philosophy than to Blazutsky. Rich Migwi intended that Ozen should replace the old political parties and reach for a monopoly of power. To było potrzebne dlatego, że tradycja legionowa. It was necessary because after the death of Pilsudski, the legionary tradition started to lose its vitality. And it was necessary to give this new movement an ideology which would be neither socialist nor center-left. But an ideology which would serve the needs of Poland well. Na terenie całej Polski staraniem obozu zjednoczenia narodowego zorganizowane zostały ośrodki wypoczynkowe dla robotników. Ostensibly, Ozon was a well-meaning, idealistic social group, running holiday camps and the like for the families of poor workers. Behind
Behind the facade, Ozon developed close contacts with an illegal fascist organization. These fascist links alienated some members of the government and weakened Ozon's influence. The same Polish newsreel which enthused about Ozon included items from abroad. In Rome, Mussolini celebrated the 20th anniversary of Italian fascism. Spain. Oto stolica Hiszpanii, Madryt, w dniu wkroczenia wojsk generała Franco. General Franco's troops entered Madrid. Republican Spain was a crusade that united the entire European left. In Poland, however, Polish communists were seen as Soviet agents. But Stalin, in the course of his purges, accused the Polish communists of treachery. They were summoned to Moscow, jailed and executed. Hundreds perished. The entire leadership was wiped out. In 1938, on the orders of Stalin, the party was dissolved. I feel that uh, what dominated then, uh, as far as myself uh, uh, was concerned, uh, was a feeling of despair. Uh, because uh, on the one side was Hitler, on the other Stalin. And uh, please, make a choice. Foreign policy was the domain of Josef Beck. He had been left free to interpret the political testament of Plzudski. Colonel Beck believed that the appeasement policies of Britain and France, combined with American isolationism, left Poland with no choice but to bluff and behave like a great power. Hermann Goering continued his ritual courtship of Poland. Germany had been rearming furiously. The Nazi secret aim was to conquer Russia. Hitler sought Polish support. In the spring of 1938, the Germans annexed Austria. Beck exploited the resultant tension to settle an old score. Neighboring Lithuania had been hostile to Poland, refusing diplomatic contact and upholding its claim to the province of Vilno. The Poles threatened to march in unless friendly relations were established. Lithuania yielded. In Vilno, Rich Migwe was hailed as a hero. But abroad, Poland's sabre-rattling was seen as indicating complicity with Germany. Poland had behaved like a great power. Today is the time to reveal your love, the song says. It is not the time for rational thoughts. Munich, September 1938. Britain and France came to appease Hitler. They allowed Germany to annex the Czech province of Sudetenland, but ignored Polish demands for Czech Silesia. Just as Czechoslovakia was being dismembered by Germany, Polish troops invaded. The annexation was hailed as another triumph for Beck and Rich Schmigwe. But the stigma of sharing the spoils of Hitler's diplomacy left its mark. 
In January 1939, Hitler summoned Beck to Bechtesgarten. He demanded a road and rail link through the Polish corridor and Danzig. Beck remembered that in 1934, before signing the Treaty of Non-Aggression with Germany, Piłsudski said, Danzig is the symbol. It's an axiom. If the Germans attack Danzig, this is the end. This is the war. January 26th, 1939. German Foreign Minister von Ribbentrop visited Warsaw. Hitler was pressing for a final answer to his demands for Danzig. In return, von Ribbentrop renewed the offer of a German-Polish crusade against Soviet Russia. Moscow and the West feared a Polish-German alliance. But the Poles said no. The first generation to have grown up in independent Poland entered adult life assertive and optimistic. The political crisis came just as Poland's economic recovery seemed underway. Central planning had come into its own. An ambitious new industrial region was developed at great speed in southern and central Poland. The other economic achievement was the building of a large port at Gdynia, on the tip of the Polish corridor near Danzig. Only ten years earlier this had been a quiet fishing village. A powerful political motive lay behind Gdynia's development. To end Poland's dependence on the port of Danzig. Neighboring Danzig had been forced to suffer a disastrous loss of trade. We could have lived together without any problems, as we had done for centuries, and I think to the advantage of both sides. That was destroyed in the first instance by nationalist policy, because of the Germans. But there was Polish chauvinism too, so the chauvinists amongst themselves, no matter how much opposition they showed to each other in the streets, I mean they beat each other up, they were nevertheless equal in their fanaticism. On the 15th of March 1939, the Germans seized what remained of Czechoslovakia. Hitler's army now stood on Poland's northern, southern, and western frontiers. The surrender of Czechoslovakia started diplomatic shock waves. Beck hastened to London after Neville Chamberlain, the Prime Minister, had unilaterally guaranteed Poland's independence and integrity. Beck soon had another ally. The French reluctantly endorsed Britain's guarantee. Most of us, I mean, in the Foreign Office, felt that after Czechoslovakia, Danzig was the next item on Hitler's menu, as indeed it logically should have been, because after all, if, he, if he'd been determined to rescue his Sudetans from the Czechs, why shouldn't he want to rescue what he regarded as his Danzig from the Poles? <laughs> In the free city of Danzig, the Nazi party had virtually taken over government. There was a phrase in France at the time, I think it was Marcel Dea, then a, then a socialist leader, why die for Danzig? Pourquoi mourir pour Danzig? And this was very much the mood in France. They, they, were, they, they were not at all keen to get involved. In April, Hitler renounced his agreement with Poland. In May, Beck reported to the Polish parliament. Peace is a valuable and desirable thing. But peace, like almost everything in this world, has a price. A high one, but calculable. We in Poland do not understand the notion of peace at any price. 
there is only one thing in the life of peoples, nations and states that is beyond any price. That thing is honor. Despite a government run by soldiers, Poland's army had not kept pace with modern developments in strategy and armaments. Feverish efforts were now made to modernize it. Ten naród godny jest niepodległości, który umie o nią walczyć i za nią krew przelewać. Poland could do no more than it did to prepare its army. It couldn't get tanks, not only because we had no money, but because there wasn't anywhere to buy them. They weren't being made. And what was produced was being snapped up by the English and the French. Britain and France sent a mission to Moscow. It was a half-hearted attempt to draw Stalin's Russia into a military alliance against Germany. One of the most important members of the British section was Admiral Sir R. Plunkett Only Earl Drax. We wish them all bon voyage and a satisfactory conclusion to their discussions with the Soviet government. Uh, the Russians naturally said, well, OK, you want us to be prepared to give military assistance to Poland in the event of a German uh, attack. Well, OK, but uh, we, we, well, no, we can't just wait on our frontiers until Poland has been overrun and then we are being attacked. The only sensible thing in that case is for us to have a military agreement with Poland in which we can send our troops, if necessary, into Poland and set up an effective defence, which, of course, in the case of any normal alliance, uh, made perfectly good sense. But given past history, and fairly recent, after all, in the case of the Polish-Soviet War of 1919-1920, this was the very last thing the Poles wanted to accept, having Russian forces on their territory. Berlin, late August. Foreign Minister von Rippentrop was leaving for Moscow. Secret negotiations between Nazi Germany and Stalin's Soviet Union were about to reach a startling climax. A non-aggression treaty between the two countries was signed on the 23rd of August 1939. It contained a secret protocol anticipating a partition of Poland between Germany and the Soviet Union. Further diplomatic efforts were irrelevant. Peace was running out. Poland's independence would be a dream once more. September 1939, first Germany, then the Soviet Union invaded Poland. Soon the world was at war. <laughs> 